I'm with Judy Kefagona at the Pan Africa Hotel. We've just completed our meeting with KEPIS, the Kenya Private Sector Alliance, a meeting with the National Task Force on Wildlife Utilization. Um, Judy, you wear many hats. Can you tell me what are they? Uh, thank you, Paula. I wear many hats. Um, today I came here as a director of African Fund for Endangered Wildlife, or Giraffe Center, as most of you know it. And I also wearing the hat from the sustainable travel and tourism agenda. In another life, I sit as the chair of Mara North Conservancy, but I'm not representing the interests of Mara North Conservancy today. Okay, so today was a, a very interesting meeting. It was quite charged and you made some very powerful points. Would you mind just repeating them? Yeah, one of the things that concerns me most about this discussion that we are having today as a country on consumptive wildlife utilization is that we do not have a context. We do not have a context against which we are having this discussion. We don't have a framework. We don't know whether we are talking commoditization, we don't know we are talking monetization, we don't know whether we are talking payment for ecosystem services. We don't know the frame against which we are discussing this. Secondly, it has not been made clear to Kenyans what well, consumptive wildlife utilization is. Now when you come to this task force, wildlife is broken down to you in many, many small things. And, 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 and they want to push us down to think about um, um, wildlife being um, plants and having some food on our table. But we are concerned about the big ideas. Because we know if we are talking benefits from consumptive utilization, it will not come from those little things. We must be aiming at those species that are really, really big time and iconic and for which people will pay millions or thousands, whatever it is, to utilize them. So this is not even, this is not even an agenda for Wanjiko and Otieno. It is not to benefit Wanjiko and Otieno. Wanjiko and Otieno cannot access the license to do bioprospecting. Wanjiko and Otieno cannot pay for a license to do hunting. When Jiko and Utieno will not be able to supply some high-end restaurant in Nairobi with game meat, when Jiko and Utieno will not do, get the ability or have the ability to do culling. So who are we doing this for? This so, is the context that I don't understand. Why now? Why are we in a hurry? Have Kenyans asked for it? We should not forget that wildlife is a heritage for all Kenyans. The government is managing it on our behalf. And like I said earlier on, we cannot put a price on heritage. It has a value. But trying to put a price on it to benefit a few people and trying to pass this as, a, as something that will benefit all Kenyans is a bit disturbing for me. I, I, I don't see how we can be thinking like this in this era of consciousness where everything is about ethics and accountability. Tell me more about that. About this, the tourism sector, what, what does the tourism sector actually look for and where is Kenya placed in the world? You will be surprised, Paula, that today when we measure the competitive index of a destination, we go beyond how many five-star hotels do they have and how many international brands do they have. Yes, those things matter, but there are other things that are finding their way into that index. And some of them are environmental considerations and how conscious a destination is about its consumption and production patterns and how green that destination is. And you talked it's, about rights as well. Yes, there are issues about rights when we talk about consumption and when we talk about production patterns. I, one thing that comes to mind for me is the, is, 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 uh, the culture of the Maasai. We have spent many years in this country telling the Maasai that it is not right for them to, to kill lion as part of their wildlife, as part of their culture when they were transitioning into Moranism. But today we are thinking that that same wildlife can be utilized in a different way and that is okay. How do we reconcile those, how do we reconcile those two? It doesn't feel destination? right. It doesn't feel right. I mentioned that there's a, there's a global mood at the moment about wildlife utilization. There is a global mood to the extent that when one elephant is freed from captivity in Malaysia, the whole world celebrates. 
I have never seen that elephant. But when I see the image and I see the news, I am happy to share it and I get excited. So this wildlife is not just our national heritage, it is a global heritage. Yeah. And, and the rates at which the globe is consuming its resources is much higher than our ability to replenish the same. Now, add on to that the complexities of climate change. And we know that climate change is having an impact on our species. Talk about the bees and what's happening with the bees today. We might think that it's something very small, but the ecosystem is so interconnected. Yeah. I want to give this example that I, I, I came across on, on how ecosystems are so interconnected that even if we think we are taking the smallest bit of it, we might not think it has impact, but it does. Think about the your phone, or think mm -hmm. about any other electronic that you have, and how it is all glued together with many little parts. Now, remove one part from your phone or your computer. Yeah. Will it work? It will work. Now, how it will, will we, work as well. How will we expect natural systems that we can continuously take out from them and they will remain serving the ecological purposes for which they exist? For me, that is what consumptive utilization does. We are taking parts of a system and we are thinking that we have the ability to bring it back, yet we don't even have the understanding. I don't think we have gotten close to understanding how the ecosystem and the ecological systems work 100%. Our so, phones that we understand 100% can't work with one little bit. How about a system that we don't understand? How do we expect it to work if we continue of taking from it? That's very true. I, one of the things that I noticed in the room today and even yesterday is that there's a lot of suspicion that this task force has already made up their mind that uh, they are just checking the box. It feels um, a lot of people said how suspicious they felt. And, uh, uh, if you could say something about this fear that I keep hearing again and again that the government is just using this as a process to open the door to hunting and that this is so unpalatable that they're not offering it now. They're offering another form of utilization. It might be steak and the restaurant. Uh, which some people might think, well, I eat beef, so what's the difference beef or a zebra? Uh, but perhaps that's not the big real uh, apple at the end of it. We're looking at um, possibility of reopening hunting. Do you think that's just an unfair kind of suspicion that people in Kenya are just overly suspicious? I don't think it is uh, unfair. I think people are suspicious because either by default or by design, this discussion has not been made open. The context has not been made open. And because of that, Kenyans have been left to speculate. What could it be? Why now? The, the act has so many other things that need to be operationalized. Why this? Yeah? Yeah. Even within the consumptive utilization provisions in the act, have we taken care of every regulation that, uh, that, that supports consumptive utilization? Why are we very quick and, and, and are ready to put resources in this, in this process to make it happen so quickly so that we determine it? Why? And putting I think, so much at risk I, because I, I there think, are so many unknowns. Yes, there's so many unknowns and that, is, and, and that is why I have mentioned to this task force that when they are writing their report, if they are honorable enough, they will highlight the limitations that this process has experienced. This process has been undertaken without adequate disclosure. There has not been full disclosure to the public so that the public can participate. And I am glad that the task force has acknowledged that this was not a process of public participation. This was a process of selective engagement. So whatever comes out of this process cannot be taken to be the view of Kenyans. And we have mentioned to the task force that whatever they present to the appointing authority must come back to Kenyans through a proper public participation process so that Kenyans can validate it or Kenyans can reject it. So it cannot end with this task force because of the limitations we have highlighted for them, starting with disclosure, with understanding, with the constitution of the task force and, and, and what, what was put as their TOR. It was very, very unclear and in murky waters. Yeah, I agree. And even the composition of the task force, somebody pointed out that uh, if we are really talking about grass and plants and seeds, then how come there isn't a single botanist on the task force? 
So Judy, I just want to say thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And your comments today were re very um, inspiring. I feel like uh, we are not alone. That, that yesterday's meeting has the same issues have come up again today. And um, I hope that uh, as Kenyans, our voices do matter. I know a lot of people feel like there's no point. A decision has been made. We're just wasting time. But I think it's important that everybody gets to hear and contribute and know what are the real implications for us as Kenyans if this goes through. Thank we you. cannot abrogate our responsibility to our wildlife. Thank you, Paula. Thank you.